an action that is confusing for herbalists and confusing for the mainstream when they look at herbalism um, are the whole range of sub actions which work on the heart. We have a lot of things that work on the heart. For example, foxglove, which is now you know, the basis of um, heart failure medication in, in the mainstream. Um, I don't think herbalists can use foxglove safely. I'm not even sure the mainstream can use it safely, but that's a different, different issue. Um, the confusing factor is the words we use. Our most important tonic herb for the cardiovascular system, I think, is Hawthorne. And it's described in the traditional books as a heart tonic or a cardiac tonic. Now, herbalists know what they mean by that. But if you look at mainstream textbooks and look at um, Digitalis, it's a cardiac tonic. To us, it's not. It's a poison. It's a difference in the use of the word tonic. Um, in physiology, the concept of toning is to do with muscle tone. And what Foxglove is doing is increasing the strength of muscle contractions of of the heart muscle. Um, we're using the word tonic to imply nutritive, safe, supporting remedy. We talk about the mainstream's cardio tonics as cardio actives. And unless the herbal clinician has been trained in the diagnosis and interpretation of heart sounds, they shouldn't be using cardio actives. You can't use them safely. But with herbs like hawthorn, berries, flowers, leaves, um, dang cheng, I'm pronouncing that wrong, salvia miltioriza, I'm really bad at pronouncing Chinese words, um, linden, whole range of plants which are good support for maintaining health and supporting the healing of heart processes. But we have to acknowledge there are times when the major medication is, is totally vital big issue for somebody studying actions is to not mix up mainstream use of the word tonic with herbal use because you could you could kill somebody. So let's talk about the liver and the gallbladder. Um, the liver gets a lot of herbal press if I can put it like that because one of the old theories, a range of the older theories, identified the liver as the place where you're, you're doing all the cleansing and all that stuff. I really question a lot of the physiological underpinnings of those perspectives. So to me, hepatics are not um, the things which are going to cure people, unless they've got hepatitis. Um, there's, a, there's an old time tendency to talk about hepatics the way we would talk about a combination of an alterative and adaptogen. Put those two together and that's the old idea of the hepatic. The liver does at least seven majorly different functions, only one of which is detoxification. And we shouldn't even call that detoxification. What it is is the liver converting waste molecules into water-soluble waste molecules so the kidney can get rid of them. And occasionally this makes them more toxic. Um, a good example, a bad example, is phenobarbitone. Um, phenobarbitone, powerful sedative, but when it's metabolized in the liver to make it more soluble to get rid of it, it becomes dramatically toxic to the brain. Um, and it's the liver's detoxified molecule that kills people. It's not the phenobarbitone, just it's a synthetic, the body is doing the wrong thing. So we have to be careful with that concept. So to me, hepatics are herbs which support liver activity and there are different ones for different things and we need to differentiate between things which support the liver in a general broad way um, dandelion root burdock root um, digestive bitters um, gentian root a bunch of things like that and then possibly a more important group today which traditionally were a sub-variety of hepatic, anti-hepatotoxic, herbs which can protect the liver from chemical damage. Now this is not a traditional concept, but it's been demonstrated very clearly um, by the Germans primarily. Milk thistle seeds, um, oh, there's a range of others, but milk thistle is the most 
widely known. That's going to help protect from acute damage and in some situations actually reverse damage which has happened. And the mechanism is known. You know, I could get very pharmacological with that. The issue with, with milk thistle seeds is to have enough. It's not the usual sort of herbal half a teaspoon. Um, we're talking about large amounts. Um, but they work. They can not just um, protect from vague damage, they're specifically able to reverse the damage done by the, uh, the toxins from the Amanita mushrooms, uh, Amanita phylloides and, and Sarina, the Avenging Angel, uh, and some other ones, which every year in the Bay Area kill approximately two to three people, depends on the year, um, because people pick the wrong mushroom. It's a very, they're very devious mushrooms. If I was five or six and saw one of those growing, I would pick up immediately. It's saying, eat me. It's one of those. And if you do, you're dead. Painfully over a couple of days because it's, it's chemical breakdown of the liver. There are no prescription drugs in this country that have been approved for that indication. Um, in Europe, they use silymarin, the flavor lignans from it hasn't been approved in this country and I, I really want to know why the FDA still let people die of that mushroom poison. So. Turns out though that many of our flavonoid rich plants in if you do the right tests pharmacologically are antihepatotoxic and the implication is eating a green natural diet you have a lot of inherent liver protection in there. Um, yeah. We have another group of herbs, which are sometimes called hepatic, um, hepatics, but they're not really. They're cholagogues. Um, they work on the gallbladder and occasionally work on the liver's component that produces bile, which goes into the gallbladder. Um, chola, C-H-O-L-A, is the Greek word root meaning gallbladder, and gog, G-O-G-U-E, is the, um, the word root meaning flow. So you have amenagogues, which are things which work on menstrual flow. Cholagogues are working on bile flow. And there are other gogs in different parts of the body. In mainstream medicine, they differentiate between cholagogues and choleretics. Choleretics um, increase the production of bile by the liver. Cholagogues increase the uh, release of bile by the gallbladder. And they know this because of all the animal experiments they've done. I think it would be very difficult to be that specific about herbs, um, un unless there has been some research. But cholagogues help um, when you're wanting to uh, get bile out and get it into the gut. Um, a very useful in, in a range of metabolic conditions and totally contraindicated in gallstones or gallbladder inflammation. You don't want to be stimulating that organ at, at that time. Um, the main way I've used them is, is as digestive remedies to really help fat assimilation and, and all of that stuff. But there isn't an action which is anti-gallstone. But I actually would suggest that um, herbal approaches to gallstones um, are one of our strengths, and, and gallbladder inflammation. Um, with the new ultrasonic techniques for dispersing stones, as opposed to the old surgical techniques, then it's a toss-up which one is, is going to be better. Herbal approaches take longer, but they really do work. And there are a couple of um, Eastern American plants which uh, no herbalist in England would, would want to approach gallstones without having available. And most herbalists in this country that I talk to about this haven't heard of them, or only historically. One is uh, Chiananthus virginicus, um, whose common name I've got a complete blank on. No, no, it's not rendering. Um, Fringe tree bark. Uh, the other one is, uh, I don't know how you pronounce it, it's Chelone glabra, C-H-E-L-O-N-E, glabra, um, which in England 
we called Balmony, B-A-L-M-O-N-Y. Um, and I know that's not what it's called. Phyllis would know. This is one of her plants. Those two I've seen achieve miracles, um, unexplainable miracles in clearing gold stamps. Now, I wouldn't for a moment say that they dissolve gold stamps. I'm not sure how to dissolve gold stamps. I do know how to facilitate gold stamps being passed. Now, it's going to be painful. You've got to get it through the and pull it of Odie and you know all that anatomical stuff, but it's far less painful than it would have been. Um, one of the strange advantages of the National Health Service in England, socialized medicine that isn't funded properly, so it doesn't work very well, is that when you have a non-life-threatening surgical need, you're put on a waiting list. So I had lots of patients with gallstones who were on waiting lists, sort of six, nine months down the road, which gave me time to get rid of them. They had their x-rays from when they were first diagnosed and then retested before they were going to do the surgery. No gold stones. Um, a couple of people actually felt them pass. Uh, most of them didn't. Um, I, I don't like talking about miracle cures because there isn't such a thing, but those are dramatically effective herbs. Um, obviously, kidney stones is a different issue, but... Uh, Cologogs, you have to get into a sort of more technical level of herbalism to, to know how to use them correctly. Um, what I teach my students here when we're doing that and not being very technical, it's more important to know when not to use them um, rather than when to use them. So let me pull this to a conclusion. I think I've covered most of the actions that are convenient to talk about. There are many more actions. Um, and, you know, if you, you go to Jim Duke's database on the internet, Jim is really good at coming up with new action names. Um, these action names are not written in stone. They can be new ones. But I think if, if the herbalist gets a handle on the ones we've talked about, maybe one or two more, um, Rather than focusing on what a herb's indication is, if you get a handle on what the herb's properties are, and you have a handle on what the process behind the disease is, you can get very creative and very effective. Um, let me give you an example of where the problem is with knowing what the herb will do. Dr. Christopher is one of the best herbalists of the last century. In his book, um, School of Herbal Medicine. Mm -hmm. That isn't the right title, but School of, School of Natural Healing. Uh, every herbalist should have it. However, for the beginner, it's really confusing because under every herb, there are these massively long lists of what the herb is for. And when I was first studying it, I almost gave up herbalism because how could it do all of this? But what he did, I now realize, is if something would work on inflammations. If it was an anti-inflammatory, he'd list all the inflammatory diseases. If it worked on a certain sort of infection, bacteria, he'd list all those infections. So he'd list all, all the pathology names. So you had to learn all the names rather than getting, it worked in all of those conditions because of its action property. So I feel that understanding actions gives you the flexibility in protocol development to treat the person as you're perceiving them. And you can then add to that specific chemical containing herbs because of an insight from science or um, try something because somebody told you to. But if you're using them within the context of coherent action algorithms, choice algorithms, um, you're basically looking after your patient by ensuring you're not going to go wrong. Um, you won't mess up. You may not, it may not work, but you won't damage them. And if something does go wrong, it's really clear you've made the mistake. You've chosen the wrong action, chosen the wrong herb. So as long as um, the practitioner keeps good notes, um, knowing the actions provides future possibilities and it enables you to 
sort of analyze what was done before and actually enables me to make sense of traditions from other countries and other cultures where I don't understand their theory but I can interpret their theory and put it into my theory. I acknowledge that I'm not one of the people who can build meaningful bridges between East and West. I'm, I'm just too stuck in my Western conditioning. I totally affirm that approach. I can't do it. So when I look at the Chinese take on a remedy, I try and put it into my Western action perspective. It's my equivalent of five element theory.